Good morning. Good morning. It's been a, a fantastic week for the harvest, and um, there's not too many beans that uh, are left out in the field. Um, the, uh, the the weather has been perfect for fall harvest, and uh, uh, people are uh, going after it. And uh, uh, quite a few people are finished with the bean harvest and are um, serious about getting the uh, the corn out. So I I clipped a little. Uh, the Agri News. Uh, tells each week uh, corn harvest for grain was 26% complete compared to the five-year average of 39%. So we're a little bit behind uh, the five-year average with corn. Soybean harvest was 25% um, on October 4th as compared to 33%. So. We were running a little bit behind on that too, but this week has been a, a fantastic week, and it's amazing how quickly, uh, with the machines that we have today, that uh, we get the the uh, corn and beans out. Winter wheat harvest was 29 percent compared to the five-year average of 16 percent. So uh, those that plant winter wheat are ahead of the game on that one. So that's interesting. This is the time in our service for announcements. Uh, Marcia. First off, I want to thank everybody for their support of our basket drive-through raffle. We've done very well. Uh, just a little note, we will draw the winners after church today. Um, everybody wants to come up to Fellowship Hall. Um, and if you want to buy some more tickets, we would be happy to sell you a few, but we'll maybe take about five, ten minutes of doing that, and then we'll draw the winners. And again, thank you to everybody, and I'm also going to let you know that I have decided to retire from the basket, of being the basket chairperson. So I'm um, hoping that there's somebody else that will take it on next year, because it really is a lot of fun, and, and that and people are very creative and very generous. Other announcements? Thank you for her hard work. <laughs> Thank you for her hard work. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, in that case, uh, Reverend right. Jenny Upper. Very good. Thank you, Dave. Yes, and thank you, Marcia, for your very hard work. Where are you at? There you are. Okay. One more announcement, this Saturday at 2 will be my installation. Rick asked, wait, didn't we do that already? And the answer is no, we have not. I was had my ordination February 23rd to become a pastor, and then the installation will be us becoming pastor and church together, even though we have been doing that. So yes, we have been doing that. So many rules. So many rules, true. <laughs> Let us be called the worship. To you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul, O oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways. O oh Lord, teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Let us pray. Dear Lord, be with us in our worship of you. Keep our paths straight. Keep our minds focused. Keep our hearts focused on you as we spend this time together. Confident in God's mercy, let us confess our sins together. Please join me. Lord God, you hear our cries of pain and our murmured complaining. Your relentless compassion for your people defies any human logic or understanding. 
You provide manna in the wilderness, bread from heaven, and the assurance that you will not abandon us in our need. Despite your overflowing goodness, we grumble. Rather than rejoice in your grace to us, we resent that you extend kindness to others. Instead of gratitude for your mercy, we question why you would embrace those we think undeserving. Forgetting that none of us are righteous, all of us saved by grace. Forgive us for judging others and begrudging your generosity. We thank you for yet again hearing our cries and responding with love. Amen. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus came not for the righteous, but for all of us, all of us who have sinned. Therefore, we can believe that the good news is, in fact, we are forgiven and are now made new creations in Christ. So I brought a book for our children's sermon today. You are learning, the kids are learning the fruits of the spirit. They've done love, joy, peace. They're gonna learn kindness today. Oh, you are, good, okay, yay. <laughs> Perfect, I thought they were skipping over patience, so I was gonna do a little patience here. Perfect, all right, let's say it together, love, Love, joy, joy, peace, peace patience. patience. Okay, we're all going to learn all of these by the end. So a friend just gave me this book, Elephants Can't Fly. Everyone I've ever asked says that elephants can't fly. But what if they fly secretly just after you've passed by? I also heard that jumping is something that elephants can't do, but I know a little elephant who will prove that quite untrue. Ellie was so excited and bounced off to tell the herd, but none of the other elephants believed a single word. Daddy, Ellie called, just look, I can jump into these trees. Elephants can't jump, my love. It's a problem with our knees. <laughs> then Ellie jumped for mommy, but got into a tangle. Oh, Ellie, jumping's not for us. You're going to twist an ankle. But Ellie was determined and mustered every bit of might. A run, a bounce, then such a big jump that Ellie there and then took flight. The herd were utterly amazed and trumpeted long and loud. And do you know that trumpet sounded almost like a song? So if someone tries to tell you what elephants can't do, remember Ellie is an elephant who jumped so high she flew. I think it's a great story about patience and I am so excited to see what our kids do. Even though they have to be patient now, they might just jump and fly someday too. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, what does it profit us to gain the whole world and lose our souls? In the din of demands and distractions, send your spirit to help us discern your word and your will. Grant us ears to hear and faith to obey your teachings that offer life and life abundant. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We come to our time in scripture in the book of Exodus that we've been continuing through for the past month. To a time of wandering, to a time of wilderness. Hear these words from Exodus 16, 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. 
The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Lord Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. And then our story continues in Exodus 17, 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages, as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are all ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Masha and Meribah. Because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And finally, we come to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I brought along a cartoon to share that a friend had sent me after watching our services online. It goes perfectly with our topic for today and shows the Israelites wandering behind Moses, complaining about the trip. They are saying things such as, I am bored. He keeps stepping on my ankles. Are we there yet? <laughs> and my favorite is, she's looking at me. <laughs> 
And Moses, having had enough, looks back at them and yells, I'll turn around this exodus if I have to. <laughs> he has been pushed to his limit. Yes, the Israelites have been saved, and they have been traveling now for 45 days in the wilderness. And now they grumble, telling Moses that they would be better off being back in Egypt, given the state of their current circumstances in the wilderness. Moses faces a crisis of leadership. Those he has entrusted to lead not only grouse and complain, but they appear on the cusp of violence, ready to stone him. Moses pleads with God for help because of the people and cries out, Dear Lord, they are going to hurt me. They are coming for me. I understand his frustration and his worry, especially since I recently learned, and in Bible study this morning was questioned to this number, but it is true that their numbers were close to 600,000. That's a lot of complaining. <laughs> Can you imagine being in a car with that many people saying, are we there yet? <laughs> but God does listen. God hears the cries of the people and God says, I did not leave you here to leave you abandoned at this point. I did not. Do this so that you would starve later. So God provides. God gives them manna. And manna in Hebrew literally means, what is it? Because when they first saw it covering the ground, it was a white, flaky substance. They had no idea what this possibly could be. But it tasted like honey-soaked wafers. And everyone had all that they need. And they would use it to make bread each and every day. And within one day, whatever wasn't used went bad. It started to mold and they could not use it, but it didn't matter. Because the next day, the ground would be covered with this flaky substance and they would make bread again. It reminds me of the saying, one day at a time. I feel like I say that often. And that is what they must learn, and so do we in this story, one day at a time. Some problems, some difficulties can only be solved moment by moment. And the only day that the manna did not go bad was on a Sabbath day, for God wanted them to celebrate, to not work, to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. God hears the cry of the people that say it would be better to die with stomachs full in Egypt than to die here in the wilderness. And as promised, God comes again and gives them quail every night in the evening. Every night, great numbers of quail covered the camp. But then I continued the story into Exodus 17 where they continue the journey and they come to the last stopping place before the people of Israel reach the base of Mount Sinai. They're on their way to Mount Sinai. Some time has passed, and do you think that they learned their lesson about complaining with the manna and the quail? No, they don't. They start complaining again. This time, the lack of water. And instead of praying to be helped, they complain. Now, some problems can be solved by careful thought or by rearranging our priorities. Some problems can be solved by discussion and good counsel, leaning on a friend. But some problems, what we learn from this story is some problems can only be solved by prayer. We should make a determined effort to pray when we feel like complaining because complaining only raises our stress level. It only raises our worry, our strife. And prayer quiets our thoughts, quiets our emotions so that we may be better prepared to listen. 
to commemorate the site of Israel's contention with Moses and putting God to the test. They named it Massa and Meribah, which means proof and contention. They had a habit of naming things after what happened there so they would never forget. Everyone had all that they needed. The issue in this story is in the relationship of food and faith. The people expressed doubt to Moses and Aaron that they do not have the people's best interest at heart and that it would have been better to be at Egypt that God has disappeared as the subject of deliverance, and the people have reverted back to that pre-Exodus stance. They've gone back to what they knew back in Egypt. The food crisis has led to a faith crisis, and the people appear to be fair-weather fans of their own faith. How common it is among the people of God that a crisis whether a daily need or physical suffering creates a crisis of faith. Material and spiritual well-being are more closely linked than we would all care to admit. The discernment of the people of God has often been clouded by physical difficulties, that they cannot see that God is involved in major ways. And I understand that. I think of Karen when you're working at the food pantry each week. I'm sure you come across people that have a hard time believing when they can't have enough food to eat. These wilderness stories are increasingly about people stuck between promise and fulfillment. Wilderness is no longer a place but a state of mind. Even more, it is a description for periods of time in one's life where there is a sense of wandering, searching, maybe feeling lost. I know of my own wilderness periods where I could not see an end in sight and how nice it is to be on the side of promise and fulfillment. The wilderness is a place where it is often difficult to sort out perceptions and reality it seems like a God-forsaken place, but it is not. In our scripture today, God is still leading through Moses and Aaron. God's leading may not always make sense to us, and we must too recognize that people will be disobedient. They may not always result in going where God wants. Leading does not involve coercion, and Israel could not have taken different paths through the wilderness because God was there the whole time. And even in their complaining, they were still obedient. Obedience in the midst of wilderness brings order into chaos. The gift of water of life comes from the same source as the gift of law, which we will be discussing next week. It will be our focus. So what does this story mean for us today? God's gift of food and water in the wilderness are providential acts. They sustain the community of faith in the midst of hardship. But we need to see them as more than that. We need to see them as acts of creation and recreation. In other words, God is continuously at work. And how do we exercise leadership when it is entrusted to us? Are we called to complain or are we called to be leaders looking to God? The simplest but also the hardest part about being a disciple is avoiding falling into the cultural narrative act of I need more, I want more, I deserve more, and therefore others should receive less. We are in a world bombarded by this message. What do we deserve? It makes us strive to work, to hunt, to be more 
And I don't think striving is necessarily bad. But when that is our only focus, when it takes our eyes off of Christ, our community, one another, that's when it becomes a problem. God's grace cannot be counted if we fail to live out the possibility of joy rather than to see the shortcomings. We must stop and ask ourselves, are we doing everything we can to create a place that takes others out of the wilderness? Are we doing everything we can to live in a life of faith rather than fear? I hope we are. And I hope we are one day at a time. Amen.
getting better every day, and uh, so she's seeing a little bit out of that eye at this point. Very good. Carol also asked me to pray for Glenn, your son, who's having AFib, correct, at right. 46? Our son, Glenn, is, uh, is having uh, problems with his heart, and they're Also, Jerry let me know that he will have to have a pacemaker put in on October 23rd, and Betty is still recovering from her eye surgery, so they're giving her a little more time before they start the radiation on the eye for more healing. So, anything else? Uh, Greg's grandfather, my husband, passed away. He was 96, uh, Frank Bender. Can you tell me his name again? Frank Bender.
all of our congregation making a decision next week in the congregational meeting. Be with us in our discussion, in our discernment. Be with us as we are called forward to do your will and to decide as one body, one body of Christ. Be with us in our words and in our actions in everything. Lord, you taught us to pray together these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But I am the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As God's chosen one, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.